Good morning. I will be reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25 this morning. Now this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. As he considered this, he fell asleep, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to, mar marriage to Mary, for the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded. He brought Mary home to be his wife. But she remained a virgin until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. How are you doing? Have you been thinking about superheroes this Advent? Okay, nobody has. Look at you. Don't you remember just two weeks ago we had, I don't know how many, a dozen Batmans at church? How soon do you forget? Well, by calling Jesus a superhero type name, we didn't put him down at all. We called him Amazing Emmanuel. And that's what we've been talking about, getting, taking what our culture has taught us through comic books, the superhero is something that we all love to think about because the superheroes are only there because they've been given powers to help people. And so it sort of fits, doesn't it, that Jesus is our superhero. And quite frankly, there's, people can get... Well, if you watch any of the superhero movies, you know that um, they're never always popular. They always go too far and knock the wrong building down, or they, they, they catch the wrong guy, and so their, their popularity goes up and down. And it's sort of that way with our superhero, Jesus, isn't it? Sometimes we can get cranked up, and at Christmas time and Easter time, we can spend a lot of time thinking about Jesus, and yet he came to this earth and gave us a relationship with God, made possible a relationship with God for eternity. And so we do need to get excited about that. But this morning we want to talk about uh, the powers to help others, the superheroes. But first of all, I've got to get something out of the way. Um, when I say Peter Parker, what do you say? All right, you must have a 10-year-old in your house. When I say Bruce Wayne, what do you say? Not anybody but you, okay? <laughs> These guys aren't doing so good. Looking over here, there's one more. Let's see. Oh, Clark Kent. Oh, you would have got that one too, wouldn't you, Larry? Yeah. For some of you that are saying, what's he talking about? I'm talking about the secret identities of three of the, the most famous superheroes from at least my childhood, and they've, they keep, they must have made a lot of money on those kind of things if they keep coming. Uh, what are that, Spider-Man 7 now or something? I'm not sure. Or, or Batman 18. They don't even give numbers to them anymore. They just give <laughs> names of the movies. And uh, they call them, they, when they run out of more sequels, they start calling them prequels. And then we all get in, uh, confused about, oh, that one was supposed to happen before that one and all that kind of stuff. But they're still rolling in the money on the, just on those three. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones too. But this secret identity thing, it seems to be, it's so important to this, I, this thing that there's an ordinary guy and then all of a sudden he runs into a phone booth and I don't think Spider-Man goes into the phone booth, does he? It's somebody else. Batman, where does he go? Oh yeah, he sees the big light, right? And then he runs to his cave or something like that and I just 
But I think nothing beats this, the, the phone booth. I was going to get a phone booth up here and, and try going in there and coming out, but, it, well, that might take up way more time than we need to, and even as it is, I just want to get across one clear idea, that our superhero, the amazing Emmanuel, never has had and never needed a secret identity. And I'm about to talk lots about that this morning because Jesus didn't live a double life. The story of Jesus isn't fixed with surprises and, and fiction. Verse 21 of our scripture says, She will bring a son to birth, and when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. Right from the very beginning. Well, it's way farther back than that in the Old Testament too, but... The angel said to Joseph, you will name him Jesus. God saves because he will save his people from their sins. Our superhero doesn't need a secret identity. In fact, just as Larry mentioned from Isaiah, the, the passage full of all kinds of names for Jesus, but they're not secret identities. They're descriptions of the, the wonderful things that our Savior has done and will do for us. And the Bible is very clear that this isn't a secret revealed. It's a truth revealed. Before he was born, before the word became flesh, it was known that Jesus would be the Savior, the rescuer of the weak. Before he was born. The greatest need still in our world is meaning and understanding, a sense of belonging. And that's what our Jesus has brought to us and brings to us. And, and that's what it was predicted that he would bring to us. Before he was born, it was known he would be a hero who rescues those in need. I want us to think about this this morning. That our hero, amazing Emmanuel, Jesus, has always been part of the plan to meet the needs of all of us. When we think about the title that we have for our sermon, our time this week about protecting the weak, I know that um, we need to be thinking about how God uses us to protect the weak. And we need to be encouraged to protect the weak. But in order for that to sink in, for us to be able to look around and see who's weak and who needs protecting and who needs help, we need to receive that kind of protection in our own life. We need to recognize our weakness and our need to be rescued, our need for a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. The story, the Christmas story, is not just about the baby. And Jesus has always been the plan to rescue us from meaninglessness, to bring us to be a part of the family. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, a few verses there. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Jesus Christ. We're not a fan club of our superhero, amazing Emmanuel. We belong to him. Long ago, that's how a lot of the stories start, eh? long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family, to bring us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. Wow, this is a whole different idea than just a baby coming and we, come, we, we get enthused because um, wise men came and, and gave gifts to the baby so uh, we should say, oh, we should give gifts to other people. Let's go buy a whole bunch of money, and, oh, spend a whole bunch of money and, and give gifts. Isn't it nice the way we get in, enthused by our Bible and changed? No, it's way more than that. It's not, Christmas story is not just about the baby. It's about us being adopted into the family of God. 
through Jesus Christ. The details of the story are wonderful, and we, need, and we do celebrate them. We tell them over and over and again, and we need to be ready to tell them correctly. If we don't tell them just right, then the History Channel will put something on and correct us and, and confuse everybody. It's amazing that they couldn't have left that, those specials, how the Bible's not true, or something like that, to some other time of the year. But I guess more people are looking to watch and, and find out, get excuses about why they don't bother accepting the gift of Jesus Christ. But we do need to know the story. We need to know the right story. We need to know that it is about God's love for us, for eternity, that he's given us his son, Jesus, as Jesus began his ministry. We need to realize that Jesus, yes, he came. It was all part of the plan, a plan for you and I to be right with God. And then we jump ahead 30 years we understand very clearly that Jesus knew why he was on earth. No mystery about having to get dis discovered. And, and some people will say, well, he had to go out in the desert and, and uh, he was just a man and he had to do this and he had to do that. And, and they equate it to uh, some part of the story of Batman and Superman and when they finally decided they had their superpower. Well, Jesus knew all along. And we, re we know that there's lots of talk about Jesus. Lots of people say things about Jesus, but in Jesus' own words about himself, it's very, very clear. His job was to proclaim and go into action. And that's where there was lots of prediction for the, when the Messiah was going to come and what he was going to do. So Jesus made it very clear. And let me read to you what Jesus said from Luke chapter 4. This is the baby, 30 years later the baby Jesus from the manger, and now he, it, that's what they're talking about here, is when he, Jesus, came to the village of Nazareth, Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went, as usual, to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll containing the messages of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He didn't even go over to the the box with the scrolls, it, he just, it was handed to him. That was the reading that the, the, the church workers, the Sabbath workers just handed him. The scroll containing the message of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll to the place where it says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue stared at him intently. Then he said, and must have said it in quite a loud voice because he had already sat down, this scripture has come true today before your very eyes. And some other versions make it much clearer where Jesus says, this is about me. I am that person who's proclaimed, been given the job to come and proclaim and to set the captives free. This is the good news. Because when we think of being captives or the poor, the blind will see, the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors. They say, oh, isn't that nice that, that we have a superhero that's going to look after the poor and the weak. And we can do that real quick. And we say, well, I'm glad I'm not downtrodden. I don't particularly feel that anybody could oppress me this week. You ever feel that way? No, eh? It's the other way around. It, there are people a lot worse off than you and me. That's a given. But that doesn't mean that we don't feel that way. That doesn't mean that we don't have people picking on us. That doesn't mean that we don't have <clears throat> a shortage of cash. 
Oh, sure, in the other parts of the world, you can compare it and say, well, hey, we're really rich. And I could preach and make you feel really bad about all the money you have. But that's not the point. The point is that we are, are in need. We are the point of Jesus' reason for coming to this earth. We are downcast. We are the blind. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I can see. But can you? Isn't this the whole idea of needing to be in a right relationship with God so that we can see the needs of other people around us, that we can see something else besides ourselves? That's the kind of blindness that we need to have fixed. Jesus came to this earth to proclaim freedom. And he came to give it to you and I. We are the poor. We are the captives. We are the blind, the downtrodden. The wonderful thing is, is that when we recognize that our Savior came and did that for you and I, it's one of these things where it, once we are set free, what are we set free to do? The list of where, what you're being set free from is kind of personal. You've got a whole list of that in, in, in you in terms of things that are holding you back, that are giving you fear and pain and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of personal. That's what you're set free from. But what are you set free to do? To also proclaim, to also set free the captives with the very power that Jesus Christ has done it for us, we do it for others. We can often do it with words. If you're there at the right time with the right words, you can make the poorest feel rich, even, not even take your wallet out. It's an amazing thing. You can take the rich words of the love of Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and dump them on somebody in a, such a beautiful way that they feel rich. You've done that. You've had it happen to you. With the right words, we can do that. We can proclaim that there is hope. And I trust that you folks are, have tasted that wonderful experience of waiting it out while somebody is in a, a terrible state of grief. And you sit and you wait with them. And it may not even be the same day. You may go back and do it again and just be with them in their grief and their pain. But there comes a time when you have the right words to proclaim release. Give them hope in a relationship with their creator through Jesus Christ. Jesus knew what his ministry was. And we need to know what ours is. Setting the captives free, being there for others. Freedom from oppressors. There's just so much oppression, and not just those us poor people who want to say Merry Christmas and somebody tells us we need to say Happy Holiday. I mean, that, I guess that's really oppression, but uh, there's a lot worse than that. Satan's got so many good tools. He confuses us takes our stub toes and our, and our bitterness and, and wants, tells us we have to blame somebody else or somebody's trying to get us. When it's, very, it's him that's get, trying to get us. Get us to look away from our amazing Emmanuel. So we need to be there. The wonderful thing is that we, we need to be there in word and we need to be there in action too. So we who continue to do his ministry need to follow how Jesus does it. We need to follow his rescue mission. Jesus was a very different kind of superhero. His superhero task was completed on the cross. Was completed as he defeated death on the resurrection 
We don't need to go through that kind of death. We don't need to go through a continued separation from our Creator, our Heavenly Father, because of His actions. And yet, so many strut around as if they're going to do it on their own. They're not afraid of Satan. They're going to take him on. They're going to deny that he's even there. That's the, safe, that's the safest way to go. And I, I don't believe in Satan, they'll say. I don't believe in this spiritual stuff. When I die, I'm just going to go into the dirt and nobody's going to bother me. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. There's more to it than that. But our superhero has completed his task. Satan has been defeated. So the wonderful thing is that, that we need to grasp this morning, that we need to become the rescuers like Jesus is. Let me read to you from, from the Gospel of John. John 20. That evening, the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind the locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Do you know your Bible well enough to know where John 20 fits in? It's after the crucifixion and after the resurrection. The reason the disciples are frightened is because they just saw what happened to Jesus. They had reason. They just weren't being little sissies about things. Well, they should have listened to Jesus, but he's going to fix that in a minute. Watch this. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. And he says, peace be with you. Kind of like the angels to the shepherds. You know, most, eh? Peace be with you. And why would he have to say that? Well, he just walked, just appeared. The door didn't open. Okay, they didn't tell us the door didn't open. But if it did... They would have said, Jesus opened the door and came in. That's probably what the John would have written, eh? But he doesn't. It says, he appeared for them, before them. So they, were fright they thought they were frightened of the authorities. Can you imagine how they were feeling when Jesus all of a sudden right there? So his words. They're just on the piece of paper for us to read, or on the screen. It says, peace be with you, he said. <laughs> Not much power in that. But what powerful words that the disciples needed so that they could hear Jesus, next words. I think that's very important before I go on here, is that we need to take that promise from our Heavenly Father that there will be peace in our lives, that things will be in order in such a way that we're not fussing with so many other things that we can't hear what's going to be said. This week, the CBC was interviewing a a young girl from Meadows School, and it was a Winnipeg program, and the kids in Meadows had gone down to our, uh, our Samaritan's Purse Food Bank, and they had got to work there. And so the CBC was interviewing these young kids, and uh, the one girl said, well, we sure felt good helping out at the food bank because my mom says uh, if your stomach's empty, you can't think or something like that. But if you're... I didn't got a real good quote here, but the idea was, if you've got a full stomach, then you can receive and think and stuff like that. We believe that. Things need to be in order in order for us to be able to understand things. Jesus said, peace be with you to the disciples. Then he said, as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see. You're understanding and remembering what the hands would have looked like. Some of you medical people know that the artist that put the little wee tiny hole or a little scar on those hands um, after a few days know that that's not what it would look like. The brutality. Jesus had a real body, even though it just went through the doors and walls. But he still had hands that would have been terribly scarred and ugly. He held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. <laughs> this is weird. They saw the brutally beat up hands inside of Jesus, and John reports they were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. 
They saw beyond that. They saw past that physical stuff to the significance of that Jesus was with them, alive. The story of Jesus, of, of, a shepherd, of, of the shepherds and the, the manger and the, the journey on a donkey or with the donkey or whatever and the, the, the humble beginnings of our Lord and then the cruel rejection of Jesus right to the point where they crucified him. We can get hung up on that. We can stay there. Say, well, that's no superhero. That can't be about me. But it is. Are we filled with joy with the whole story? Is, do we need to grasp the Christmas story? We need to grasp God's story for us and be filled with joy because we understand that Jesus is with us. The disciples, the mixed emotions, it just must have been incredible for them. Trying to put this all together. They're traveling, walking companion, day in and day out of all the, for three years. They had all this political stuff on them too in terms of their hope of Jesus getting rid of the Romans and all that stuff mixed up in their heads. Their lives had been changed forever. And the emotional low of Jesus being taken from them. And then all the confusion of him defeating death and was alive again. And now he's in front of them, showing his hands and his side, and he's with them. So, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. He spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me. You ready for this? I wonder if they were ready. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Hmm. I, I can picture myself there, and in, in some ways I can stretch my imagination that with the emotional high of everything, he's, he's with us. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. And then he says again, peace be with you, and then he does this. The Father has sent me, and they may have thought about the story of the humble beginnings and the carpenter shop and the walking around and the preaching and then the crucifixion. And he says, the Father has sent me, and so in the same way, I'm sending you. They must have swallowed. He said, uh, you don't really mean it all that way. You just mean, well, he didn't, it just says. Then he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You see, he didn't say that you're, I'm sending you to do this the way you think it should happen. I'm sending you to do these things not in the way and in your power, in your strength, and the agenda that you would choose. Because that's how, how, how so many Christians seem to do it. They figure out and, they, and we rejoice together that we are one in Christ, we're a body of believers and we, we, we receive Jesus into our hearts and we do all this and then we set about doing God's work according to the agenda that some, we got some our fathers or our mothers or somebody else or some TV evangelist or something and we go with that. <laughs> we wonder why we get so mixed up. We wonder why we get, fall on our faces on this. When Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so, I send, so send I you, and then he gave them the Holy Spirit. When he did that, from within, we do not need to be confused because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Of course, there's actions that we need to take and build good habits and, and submit to the Holy Spirit and, and let our minds be shaped by the Holy Spirit and recognize that there are things, that habits that we get ourselves in and places that we go and ways we waste our time that just... Don't allow the Holy Spirit to even get it working in us, even though he's in us. What a wonderful thing that Jesus said to his disciples and says to you and I, <laughs> so send I you. The greatest gift. When you think about the greatest gift you ever received, if you're like me, 
I receive lots of great gifts. But something happens. As soon as somebody asks that question, it flips around. I start thinking about, really, the greatest gift I ever gave or got to give or be a part of. That's the way our minds work because it's true. We like to give. And so we think about the greatest gift that we've received. We recognize that it's tied in with the greatest gift that we have to give to others. Can you imagine that what we've been sent to do, we've been given an assignment. However you want to picture it. Standing in front of a throne room with the king saying, this is your job, and he reads it out to us. That's okay if you want to do that. However you take that assignment, however you hear that being said to you, listen to this. The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. It's more than just orphans and widows, but it's, this is the opportunity that you and I have to go and care for others and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them so that they can have hope, that they can have peace, that they can have eternal life. To bind the brokenhearted, to set the prisoner free. Two weeks ago, we talked about John and then we put something under the tree. Can you see it there, Rocky? You want to hold it up for me? The sandal with the piece of paper. Some people might not have been here and they'll say, what's that about? I'm not going to have you read the paper. Just hold it up. It's okay. My dirty old sandal. <laughs> we put it there with a piece of paper that says, put this in a place in your home so that you're reminded that John said, Jesus needs to increase and I need to decrease. When you think about the gift that you can give at Christmas, it's okay, you can just put it down. We, the gift that you can give at Christmas, you can give the truth about the baby Jesus, the Savior Jesus, the amazing Emmanuel. You have that gift to give. And when you give that gift, broken hearts will be healed. Prisoners will be set free. We talked about sharing that gift last week. And this week, well... Same thing again, I guess. Eh? We need to understand that our Heavenly Father has given us an incredible gift. And an incredible gift includes a sense of purpose for you and I. What a gift that he's given us. We can understand that our purpose is to be sent like Jesus was sent into the world to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, to proclaim God's Love to the world. Do something for somebody this week. Fulfill your task. And this Christmas will be different than every other one you've ever had. Be there. Make the call. Send the card. Take the time. The Holy Spirit is in you. He will guide you and protect you and put you in the right place at the right time with the right actions and the right, right words. You don't need to be afraid of that. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. They're all around us, not just physical orphans. People that don't have Jesus Christ need him. They need a Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for the gift of, of our amazing Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can be encouraged and challenged by your word each time we gather together. Lord, may this Christmas season be so much clearer to us in terms of our relationship with you and the things that you'd have us do. As the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen.